All right, I'm gonna show you guys how to set up motion on the Linux platform today. Uh, in particular, I'm running Ubuntu 12.04. Uh, first things first, we have to install motion, so we're gonna fire up a terminal. Uh, you can also do this through Software Center, but I'm gonna do this through terminal um, to uh, show you guys something in particular. All right, for one, motion, when you install it, it actually adds a user named motion. That's because Motion, the application, runs as Motion, the user. Uh, I was not aware of this originally, and I was trying to get Motion to run as myself, as Jason here, and I was having a lot of difficulty with it. Once I realized that Motion runs as Motion, uh, it, it ran beautifully. So I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, we'll circle back around with this later on, uh, but I just wanted to get it up on the table for right now. Um, secondly, the daemon does not automatically start. In order for the daemon to automatically start, you have to, to uh, enable it in this file here, in Etsy Default Motion. Uh, we'll also circle back to this later on, but those two things are what I wanted to highlight to start. Now all the configs are stored in Etsy Motion, so we'll CD over to there. Clear the screen, do an LS. Now, we have a couple different files here. Um, you're going to use these files depending on what your setup is. If you're running a single camera setup, you're only going to be editing motion.conf and you won't have to worry about the thread files. If you're running a multi-camera setup, that's when these thread files are going to come into play. The way to look at it is this. Motion.conf is going to be the parent of them all. It's going to be the global configuration. That's where your common uh, configurations are going to be saved. The only things that you're going to put in the thread files are going to be things that are exclusive to those particular cameras. So if you have settings for camera one that are exclusive to camera one only, such as the URL or the resolution, you're going to put that in thread one. And the same for thread two for camera two and thread three for camera three and so forth. So just to recap, motion.com for single camera setups or in multi-camera setups you'll have common uh, global configuration here and individualized configuration here that are exclusive to each camera now we're uh, in this tutorial we're only going to be using one camera and it's a network based camera so we're only going to be tinkering with the motion.com file so I'll edit this file accordingly and bring it up here now one thing to keep in mind, yeah this does look like a lot of text, but it's actually uh, very easy and I'm going to tell you guys why. Let's take this whole section here. Each one of these lines starts with a pound symbol. With it starting as a pound symbol, it means that it is commented out. So anytime you see a line starting with a pound symbol, it's meant to inform you of something. In this particular case, here is all of the uh, different values that are available for this setting right here. So realistically, all you have to do now that you know that the comment tag means it's to inform you is really just read these sections and adjust whatever parameters you need for whatever corresponding setting you're dealing with. So uh, we'll go through a couple. Um, there's actually not much in this file I change. Uh, I let the vast majority of it as default, but we'll change a couple things uh, so you guys can get the feel for it. Uh, right here is resolution. Uh, my camera is a 1280 by 800 resolution, so we'll put that in. And uh, just like that, our resolution is set. Frame rate, it defaults to 2. Uh, I like to ramp it up a little bit, so we're going to put in 10. Uh, just keep in mind, whatever settings I adjust here, I'm just adjusting them for my particular scenario. Uh, it's very, very likely that uh, your scenario might be completely different. Um, so uh, we're going to keep scrolling down here. Netcam URL. This is going to be important for you uh, guys out there using network cameras because this is where you're going to put in the actual address to that camera. Keep in mind, this line here starts with a semicolon. That essentially means that this entry here is deactivated. So we want to activate it by deleting the semicolon so the system knows when it gets to this line that it has to actually use this line. Value, the word value here is just a placeholder for the actual value. So I'm going to type in my value for my camera. 
Uh, now keep in mind, this is going to be very camera specific. Um, you might have to do a little bit of digging, uh, whether it's through the user guide, through Google, uh, through any resource, in order to find out what the exact URL is for your particular camera stream. Uh, this is important to figure this out, otherwise you're not going to be able to uh, pick up on any streams that your camera is firing out. Uh, but this is what it is for my camera, so we're going to plug this in accordingly. Uh, Netcam user pass. I did set up a generic user on my uh, network camera's web interface. Um, because I did that, we have to put those credentials in here so Motion can access it. So like before, we're going to take the semicolon out. going to remove value because that's just a placeholder. And let's look above and see what it tells us. Syntax is user colon password. So we're going to do user colon password. Uh, this is just a very generic user that I set up for this tutorial. Um, you definitely want to use something a little more uh, difficult than this in actual practice. Uh, but we're going to keep moving on here. Some brightness settings, contrast, uh, threshold. This here, if we read the uh, little blurb uh, up top, is the number of pixels that have to change in order for the system to detect motion. So if you want to make this less or more sensitive, you want to adjust this number here. All right, here's a very, very important feature, mask. The mask is uh, going to be important for those users out there who have an outdoor camera or even an indoor camera where something within the um, within view of the camera is going to be susceptible to moving. Uh, the most common example is going to be if your camera has part of a street within its view. What that means is each time a car goes by, it's going to be triggering motion. So if you want to block out the street, you can do that rather easily. What I recommend doing is I recommend taking a screenshot with your camera and load that into GIMP. By utilizing a screenshot that your exact camera took, that means that the screenshot you're editing is going to be the exact same resolution as your image or as your camera so it's going to be very accurate. All you have to do is you're going to utilize the paintbrush tool and you're going to paint the picture black and white, black where you don't want motion to be detected, white where you do want it to be detected and essentially block out the street. After that, all you have to do is save it as a PGM, which you would do by going to File, then Export, and there's going to be an entry called File Type. Scroll down till you see PGM and select it accordingly. That way, uh, you'll be saving your mask as a PGM file. Uh, please note if you save it as a, as a JPEG or as a PNG, uh, this won't work. It does have to be as a uh, PGM file. Just like before, in order to activate this feature, we have to take out the semicolon. And the value here is going to be the full path. So, uh, personally, I like to keep uh, the mask stored in Etsy Motion, uh, just to stay organized. That way the mask is in here with all the other config files. doesn't matter where you put it, just make sure you put in the exact path to wherever it might be located. So, using Etsy Motion as an example, we'll put this in. And let's say my file is named mask.pgm. And uh, right there we have it. It's activated. Uh, here's the full path. And that's pretty much it. So that one's good. Now in this particular uh, tutorial, I'm not going to be setting up a mask file. So I'm going to undo what I just did. Okay, we're back to default there. All right, just to highlight this feature, uh, post capture, number of frames to capture after motion is no longer detected. Let's say you want to capture a couple seconds of video feed after motion is no longer detected. You'll put that number in here accordingly. So if you're recording at 10 frames per second and you want 5 seconds, you'll do 50 frames. So we'll let that in there. Next one is we have gap. Gap is the number of seconds of no motion detection that triggers the end of an event. What that means is if somebody walks by the camera and triggers motion, and 50 seconds later somebody else walks by and also triggers motion, they're going to be classified as being part of the same event. If you want this adjusted accordingly, 
Uh, you can go right ahead, two, five, ten, you know, whatever you might prefer. I personally, I, I'm okay with it at 60, so I'm going to let that as is. As you can see, we're getting down into the image file output, so there's going to be some things down here that I'm going to adjust to my particular uh, setup. Uh, by default, Motion is going to be saving your feed in a series of JPEG files, and on top of that, it's also going to be saving an SWF file or a flash file. I personally uh, adjust everything so I get a video feed out instead of a series of JPEG files. Uh, in particular, I like to utilize the AVI extension. Um, by me adjusting this to AVI, it kind of negates the point of having JPEGs, at least in my opinion. So to save the disk space, I turn off JPEGs. So I'll adjust this to off. Uh, you might want to read through these couple entries here. Uh, maybe you want to set it to first. As you can see here, valid values are on off first best center. Uh, first is where the first picture of the event is sa uh, saved. Um, best is where the image with the most amount of motion is saved and so forth. Uh, personally, I just like to turn it off, so we're going to set that accordingly. And like I said, I like to adjust the SWF, which is this section here, to actually save an AVI. So, I'm going to remove SWF. And looking through this section here, we'll look for AVI. And right here's AVI, so here's the line that's going to be relevant. So I have to use MPEG-4 or MSMPEG-4 to get an AVI extension. Now that doesn't mean put AVI here. We have to do MPEG-4 MPEG or MSMPEG-4 uh, in order to get the AVI. So this here, as you see it, is the correct syntax to get an AVI output. So we're going to keep scrolling down here. We're in text display. Text right is going to be what's in the uh, right corner. Um, looks like it's uh, year, month, and day. I'm going to leave that alone. Um, text left is disabled. You can see the semicolon, but um, a lot of people like to put in the location of the camera here so you can have like garage or backdoor camera, front, you know, and so forth. Um, I'm going to let that alone. Uh, text double refers to uh, the characters on the image. Um, I'm going to turn this on because it does make them twice the size. Target directory. This is super important because this is going to be where your motion feeds are saved. As you can see, by default, it's saving to a temp directory. That means it's going to be wiped when your system reboots. Now, in my case, I'm going to save it to a hard drive I have mounted at media, storage, and then I have a folder on there called motion. So I'm going to make this my target directory. Now, this is super important. As I said at the beginning, when you install motion, it creates a user named motion. You want to make sure that the user motion has right access to this directory. If the user motion does not have right access, they will not be able to save any feeds to this drive. So that basically means you will get nothing if motion is detected. So make sure your permissions are set right and make sure that uh, the user motion has full access to this directory.